find the light, we need to control the darkness. Ooh, that might make a great t-shirt. Hello Minders, welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. You know, today we're going to cover an often faced challenge with watercolorists, and that's painting intricate light backgrounds over dark backgrounds. Now, if you paint in an opaque medium, such as oil or acrylic or gouache, that's usually not a problem because you just paint right over the dark background. You just paint light over dark. But watercolor is traditionally a transparent medium, and most people like to treat it transparently as much as possible. So you can't do that. You have to paint the dark background around all the white highlights, which includes some challenges. Yeah, it's a challenge for the reasons I just stated. You can't paint opaquely right over the dark background. I mean, you could, but that's not traditionally watercolor. Yeah, I know. You like to spend most of your time in the dark anyway. Everybody give it up for my dark-loving friend here, Reese. Anyway, we're going to talk about three methods for kind of approaching this challenge. A traditional and a little bit more mixed-media method. And just kind of see the benefits and the drawbacks of each method, okay? Let's get to it. All right, so what I have here is a watercolor block. Uh, this is actually a fluid watercolor block, which I'm not real fond of but i use it sometimes for practice it is 100 percent cotton what i want you to get is the three methods for doing light foliage over dark now this can be grasses this can be brush lines this can be little stick kind of things it can be like a field of wildflowers uh it can be anything but it's particularly a situation where you have bright or light colored brush and foliage over a dark background and that presents some challenges there are three basic methods for doing this and there are a lot of variations on it but i'm going to show you the three basic variations the first one is just going to be with brush strokes uh, just painting in there will be no white uh, you're planning basically to paint around what is going to be your foliage detail so you'll either have to kind of draw, you don't have to draw every detail, but you either have to know where you're going to put what, and then you'll have to know how to negatively paint around that to get the effect. Now the way I usually like to approach this method is I go ahead and I paint in the light color first. And it, it can be very light. You can go back in and do some stuff to that later, but you're painting this first because it kind of gives you a guide. You know, you can have some little grassy things going on. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I just want you to get the method. So there's our, our grass. So what I want to do now is let that dry. So I'm going to let that dry and then we'll come back. I quickly threw that in there, but I just wanted to point out and stress that you can make this as intricate as you want. But just keep in mind that when you're putting in your dark background, you're going to be painting around that. And... The more time you have to spend painting around, the less you're going to be able to manage that background and the continuity of that background. And what I mean by that will become a little clearer later when we get to the next method. The best way to manage it, because you're going to end up with areas drying when other areas are still wet, is I go ahead and I paint in as much dark background above it as I can. So let's say, and I know I'm going off the edge of the paper here, so I apologize, but that could be way up here. And, you know, you're painting all these trees or it's another brush line or, it, you know, whatever it is. And it helps to have it on a little, I've got a little bit of an incline here. The water is going to run down and make a bead or a leading edge. I also like to have a large, this is a number 12, I think, round, and it will make a nice point so i can then take and while this will all stay nice and wet and i can kind of paint into these negative areas and i can maintain a good bit of continuity but now keep in mind with this this method the only detail you're going to have is what you can render with a brush you're keeping it nice and wet up here above so that you don't end up with any areas drying before the other areas that produce a splotchy looking washes if you especially if you're wanting if you don't care that's fine but if you're wanting to keep a nice continuity 
uh, of wash in the background. It's helpful to keep that whole area wet. But if you're wanting to get that a little more filigree, then you can switch to a smaller brush and just kind of, you know, filigree those edges. And so that's what I would call the simplest, most straightforward way. You know, you can negative paint to your heart's content. Simple, that's a simple method. It's a popular method. It requires no planning with, with masking fluid, but it's immediate. It has a lot of, of attractions, I think. It's a, it's a very immediate kind of just get down, paint, and get it done. All right, so the second method is using masking fluid. Now, I'm not going to turn this into a masking fluid tutorial. I hope if you're not familiar with masking fluid and how to use it, I hope you'll go look at my masking fluid tutorial and I'll put a link to it down in the description below if you want to go watch that. Uh, just in short, I don't use brushes. Some people do. I use these little rubber applicators um, and sometimes I'll use sticks and sometimes I'll use what I call ugly brushes, brushes that I've kind of taken for just using with uh, masking fluid. Uh, if you use a brush, I will just caution you, make sure it's not a brush you normally use for watercolor and make sure you soap it first. Uh, and that's fine. A lot of artists do that. I don't. I use these rubber kind of applicators. Now I'm going to take my, what I call my ugly brush or my funny brush, and I'm going to get it wet on the tip. And I'm just going to bounce it. Just gives me kind of a nice uh, organic pattern the nice thing about masking fluid is you can get a bit more intricate with your foliage you can you know make all kind of little neat little frilly things happen and i'm going to fill in down here just real quick i'm doing this really quickly or i could spend all day just masking and sometimes I like to just go through and make some of these dots flow together. One of the advantages is if you want to do a little kind of stick or tree things, you know, you can do that. So here I'm just going to draw a little kind of a sticky sapling bush, you know, bear thing. That's really hard to paint around. Uh, so that, you know... That's an advantage. Okay, for demo purposes, that's that's enough. And you want to paint down far enough uh, that you can just paint right over that because this is the advantage to this is getting continuity in your paint, in your background paint. All right, so my masking fluid is dry. Just since I know you'll ask, and I'll put this down in the uh, description. I'm using uh, Winsor Newton Art Masking Fluid. That's, that's a good one. It's always been reliable. Another one that I find very reliable is Peebo Drawing Gum. This has a nice gray color that stands out. Again, I'm not doing a, a masking fluid tutorial here, but I do want to issue some warnings in case this is the first masking fluid video any of you have ever seen. And that is make sure that that masking fluid is dry before you paint over it or you'll have a disaster and possibly ruin a really good brush so that's the first thing the second thing is make sure you test it on your paper uh, especially cheaper papers it will tear so uh, when you go to lift it so you want to make sure it works with the paper that you have all right so here we go now this is the advantage of masking fluid is you just paint right through it and you have this, this wonderful continuity because you are painting through. And you can go in here, you know, and dab darks to your heart's content. And you're not painting around all this little filigree detail. You know? And you can dab in some beautiful wet and wet colors and get it to all kind of mix and mingle. And boom! I have painted the background. So all of that time I spent, you know, uh, modeling and dabbing that masking fluid in there was well worth it. That's the advantage. If I have the time to mask, uh, I just really like the clean, crisp feel that you get. 
So I'm going to let I'm going to dry this, and then we'll come back and lift the masking fluid. All right, the masking fluid is dry, so I'm just going to lift it. A good many artists just use their finger, and that's fine. I also quite often will use a rubber cement pickup. It grabs and, and pulls, I think, a little quicker. Again, if you've not tested this with your paper, and you've got a cheap paper particularly, or some papers are just soft, at this point you're going to be tearing up paper if you don't know if this is going to work. So I caution you. And when it's all completely lifted, you'll be able to feel it. And now I'm just going to go in with my light colors and, you know, paint. The nice thing about this is you're, you've got white now. You can uh, do whatever you want with these little white areas, you know. You can go in and if you think something should be a color, you know, you can, if it's a flower, you can dot them red. If you want to paint this branch a different color, uh, you can go in there and do that. It, uh, masking just gives you a lot of flexibility. You can sit down and, and make that a really fun process. Some of the most fun paintings I've ever done have been with masking fluid, and I've sit, and then I go back to sit down and paint in all these little white areas, and just make them look great. I'm showing you grass lines, but as I mentioned at the outset, this can be used for a variety of different things. Any place where you have foliage that is light over backgrounds that are dark. Particularly, I say foliage because foliage has all these little details. Okay, that's all dry. Now, let's go to the third and final method. And this is what I would call the multimedia method. And it's it's part, it's the method that purists frown on. And I, I'll be honest with you, I think watercolor pure, transparent watercolor purists are becoming a rare breed these days. Um, I understand it. And I don't have any problem with a watercolor purist saying, I want to paint with the truest and most pure and traditional way that watercolor has always been painted with for themselves. But what I don't get behind is when they say, and everybody else should do that too. Okay. We are kind of in an art age where multimedia is a big deal. And I have no problem using white. And that is going to be this method that we're going to talk about. White or opaque paint. I am the type of person that I like it to look like watercolor. So I use white very, very sparingly if I use it at all. Now, you don't have to do that. There are some uh, watercolorists that call themselves watercolorists and they use mostly gouache. But what I'm going to do is show you my way of incorporating uh, white or opaque paint to achieve these effects. Now, basically, it's an approach like this. Um, you paint and uh, put in a light layer of your foliage and your brush line. Then you add your background, um, and then you kind of filigree in the detail with opaque paint. Now, the advantage of using white or opaque colors is that uh, you can achieve a little more carefully rendered detail. All right, that's dry. So we're ready for our white. There are any number of ways you can do white. Uh, there, a gouache has always been a favorite way with artists um, because it's a water media. There are acrylic inks that are permanent. Now, my two favorite ways are pens, gel pens, and in this case, it's a Krylla uh, gouache. This is an acrylic gouache. This is a Holbein. There's also a Turner, I think, acrylic gouache. Acrylic gouache is basically acrylic. dries perfectly flat, and that gives me a toothy surface to glaze over if I want to. And rarely do you want something to be left absolutely pure white. You might, but you do, usually you don't. So I, I just like knowing that the white that I put down is permanent. And gel pens and the Krylla gouache will give me a permanent surface. Okay, that's just me. But you can use any white you want. Now the other challenge that you face with white, and I'm going to just start, start drawing. These are my two favorites. I have Uniball Signo 
and there's a broad and a regular and jelly roll. I use the jelly roll a lot. Jelly roll is just very reliable. Uh, it skips less than any of them. And I like it because I can just go in here and start drawing. You know, the one thing about these other methods is you're kind of stuck with what you got. Uh, to go back and modify it, you're either going to have to scrape it back with an X-Acto knife or do what I'm doing now. So I like, I always like being able to respond to what I have. That allows me, you know, a gel pen allows me to sit down and just start doing that. A lot of times they will skip, and that's the fr the frustrating thing about them. I try to keep a dark piece of paper, darker piece of paper nearby, and I also usually keep several on hand so that when one skips, I just pick up another one. And I mainly, again, I just I mainly use uh, jelly roll pens for line detail. You can blend, you know, your drawing in to the parts that you have left light already. You know, make little kind of weedy looking things. It's a very intuitive kind of responsive way to paint with what's on there. But now here's the challenge. Um, in most good experience watercolors especially those purest police out there they can tell you used white and the white does not look like the white of the paper and that's the challenge um that's the thing i try to hide and discover or disguise is the fact that this is a very bright almost a bleached blue white and most watercolor paper is a natural white so you'll see a difference this is a method that you'll want to spend some time with experimenting. This is the method that you like and appeals to you the most. You'll, you'll want to experiment with different types of white. I can tell you that usually if I can do it with a pen, I'll do that first. If I can do it with one of these gel pens, and only with one of these gel pens, then I will do that. I only go with the gouache if there's just something I absolutely need to fill in. Another thing you can do is gesso. Uh, you can thin down some gesso and paint that in. That's nothing, most gesso today is nothing but an acrylic, a flat acrylic, like like uh, acrylic gouache. So you may already have some gesso on hand. And basically you're getting a nice flat matte acrylic. And that gives you a nice tooth to paint on too. So you can see how detailed this area, but it's all too stark white. So um, what I'll do is is just go back and glaze some color over it. So I don't have that stark. Wait, I almost completely forgot about this. I'm going to throw this in as a last minute addendum. This is uh, the Zig Kuretake White Ink 30. I bought this probably four or five, six months ago, and it just got stuck back in a drawer and almost completely forgot about it. Uh, this is a highly prized opaque whiting out ink that's used by uh, cartoonists and pen and ink artists a lot. Uh, because it's so opaque that it goes well and i wanted to try this for watercolor and i've just been forgetting to do that <clears throat> i'm thinking that this will replace the gouache i had been talking about uh, just prior to doing this little addendum i went ahead and did some tests and it is indeed a really good option it dries flat i'm gonna be trying this more in watercolor if I need to do fine line details. It, it easily thins and goes in a dip pen. It goes on great with a brush. You can tint it with watercolor, um, but the thing that excited me the most is that you can glaze watercolor right over the top of it because it's matte and dries permanently. Great alternative, and if I have any problems with it in the future, I'll report that, but I think this is probably gonna be my new normal for white. Other than the gel pens, I still like using gel pens because of their immediacy and fine lines. 
there's your methods. Each each one has its advantages. This inevitably I end up using this a lot in plain air because I don't have to mask. I don't like to mask on location. If it's a very uh, nice sort of finished detailed painting, I will I'll try to employ uh, masking if I can because of the way I can paint the backgrounds behind it with such continuity and interest. But I'm not afraid to use some white in places if I there's just some key details that I need to add. So thanks everyone. I hope you'll get out your watercolors. Get out masking fluid if you have it. Get out some gel pens and gouache or acrylics and just experiment with these things and see what you can come up with. Maybe you have a technique that you like to do painting light foliage over dark. Uh, if you do, share that down there in the comments. We'd be happy to look at it. Thanks for liking and subscribing to my channel. And thank you so much, patrons, for sponsoring this channel. Um, you guys are the best, and you're making this content possible. And we will see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.